have my Bible open up to the well-known, the, uh, you probably already have, it's already dirty on your pages, the book of Obadiah. Uh, and so go ahead and turn there in your Bibles to the book of Obadiah. If you need a little bit of help and you're using the Bible on the chair, those black Bibles, uh, that is page 819. Page 819 in your Bibles uh, is where you're turning to Obadiah. It is um, a little unknown, uh, you might even say ignored book of the Bible, uh, and uh, it's one of the little fun facts regarding Obadiah uh, is that it is the shortest old book in the Old Testament. Uh, it's only 21 verses, one chapter, 21 verses. But as we're going to see, all of this, all 66 books are God's word. And so, this, just like the rest of God's word, packs a punch. For we believe what Hebrews 4.12 says, that the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It is the very thing that cuts to the heart, dividing soul and spirit. It is the word of God, and I love this. I am so excited that for many of you, I think for many of you, this is going to be the first time of being able to look and see what Obadiah is all about. In fact, I don't know, if, uh, so I've been in church world for over 40 years now, uh, and in church world, I cannot recall one message ever on the book of Obadiah. Uh, so this is my first, as well as probably for most of you. Um, so uh, we'll see how we go through here. The book of Obadiah, why is it always skipped over? Um, well, maybe you'll leave here and you go like, oh, that's why it's always skipped over. Um, I hope not. I hope not. It's God's word. I am looking forward to this. In fact, why don't we go ahead and pray and ask God to guide us in his word. Father God, again, thank you for your word. Thank you for giving it to us. And Lord, help us to understand what you are saying. Help us to, to hear what your spirit is saying as you communicated through Obadiah, the prophet to a people that had no interest in knowing what you have to say, God, we live in such a time as today. So help us to apply this message of your word to our lives. Oh, guard us from the distractions, but may we hear and follow your lead. We humbly ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. The book of Obadiah, hopefully you've found it by now. You've gone through your index if you need it, and here you are in the book of Obadiah, which, by the way, if you need a Bible, you don't have a Bible on your way out. There's a little rack right there on the right-hand side of the door. Take a Bible. Those are free. We want you to have God's Word and be able to to look at Obadiah again, uh, or read into Micah, which is what we're going to be looking at next week. A little hint, hint. Uh, we're going to be studying through the book of, of Micah next week. But let me give you an outline a little bit, give you a picture of what is so significant about the book of Obadiah. Why Obadiah? What's, what's the purpose of it? And so three main themes, purposes that, that I drew out as my studying through the book of Obadiah, and here they are on the screen for us. The first thing that we're going to see see out of the book of Obadiah is where do you put your trust? Whose authority are you under? Where is it that you're trusting? We're going to see where, where the Edomites, which is this is a message to the, uh, the nation of Edom, the Edomites. Well, we're going to see where their trust is, and it's going to beg the question, where is your trust? The second purpose of Obadiah is uh, God cares about how you respond to others. We're going to see that the Edomites respond with indifference, with cruelty, and with mercilessness. God cares about how you respond to others. And the third thing that I love is that God has the final say. God has the final say. And so here's, I'm going to give you a little foreshadow where we're heading why I think that's so important is because if you're here this morning and your heart is aching and you're wondering, God, what, are you going to show up? Why doesn't God show up? 
There's been all these injustices. I'm going through all this pain. I'm going through all this suffering. God, where are you? What's going on? I want you to hear out of Obadiah that God has the final say. That is hugely important for our lives and what you need to know today. Let's dive in. The book of Obadiah. Here we are studying through the minor prophets. 12 weeks, there's 12 minor prophets and we're in the book of Obadiah. Obadiah starts off, it says, the vision of Obadiah. This is what the Lord God has said about Edom. Okay, hold on. Before we dive in further, Obadiah, we don't know a whole lot about him, but here's what we do know. His name means servant of Yahweh. Servant of Yahweh. Servant of God. Servant of the Lord. And what's important with that is it's no mistake that God sends a man by the name of Obadiah, by the name of servant of Yahweh, to a people in Edom. Edom is, there's a nation of Israel, and just off to the southeast-ish is the nation of Edom. So they're, they're brothers. They, they sit right next to each other, and Obadiah is going to be sent to this nation of Edom and deliver a message of the Lord. And so he is going to deliver this message to a people that have no interest in knowing what Obadiah, much less what God, has to say. Now, just think about that for a moment. A people that have no interest in what God has to say. What does the Lord have to say? Eh, we don't care. Does it sound at all familiar? And I tell you, if you want anything that is that it's going to last a long time, we want to be relevant, just dive into the Word. God's Word is so relevant today to what we have. And one of the things that we learn is this Obadiah goes to a people that have no interest in knowing what God has to say, is that God's servants will go and deliver a message of God regardless of what the people think. They're going to obey God above man. Followers of God are going to obey God over man. Great principle. We see this all throughout God's word. Verse 1, this is what the Lord God has said. Jump over just the, ver the last line of verse 18. I just want to highlight something for us real quick. For the Lord has spoken. Do you hear this? He is speaking on behalf of God. He is delivering a message of the Lord. This is what the Lord God has said. Then he says, the Lord has spoken. This is a, Obadiah is a Hebrew prophet. He is going to deliver a message of the Lord to a people. And he's more interested in what God thinks and says than what the people are going to respond with and what they think. That's what the Hebrew prophet does. The Hebrew prophet delivers what God has to say. They're not interested in man-pleasing. They're interested in God-pleasing. They want to deliver what God has to say. That is a, there's a world of difference between God-pleasing and, and man-pleasing. The Hebrew prophet and the man-pleaser who speaks. Obadiah and Hebrew prophets deliver messages that aren't there to entertain the people. That's not their drive. Their drive is to deliver what God has to say. Now, that doesn't take much of a jump for us to think and consider today, does it? Think about today and what we hear today in messages. That is still true today that the Bible teacher so whether that's the preacher, whether that's the small group leader, whether that's the Sunday school teacher, is to deliver what God has said, not to just entertain the people. Always want to be about what God has to say. There's a stark difference between those two worlds. The man pleaser is going to seek primarily a message for himself. The prophet considers the grave responsibility that he has to deliver what God has said. That's really important, to speak faithfully for God. 
And just the reason why I mention that is because for you, as you find a church, as you go to a church, and as, if God so moves you away from Vegas and away from Summit Ridge, you're going to go find a new church. You want to find a place that is always under the authority of God's Word, that God's Word is the most important thing regarding what they teach, that you're going to learn a whole lot more about what God has to say than the personal life of the, the preacher, per se. We hear a lot of entertaining thoughts. A lot of times you can walk away from service and you go like, I know I really relate well to the preacher. I know a whole lot about him. Wow. And you get a little bit of Bible and a whole lot of story time. But we want to be under the authority of God's word. We want to know what God has to say, right? I want to know what God has to say. How does, what does he say and how does that apply to my life? So, that is what Obadiah is delivering to the nation of Edom. Now, they're not all that interested, but that's, irregardless, he's going to deliver what God has to say. A man that lives bravely. And look what he says. This is what the Lord God has said. Now, one of the reasons why we're doing a study through the minor prophets, and one of the things I love about this is that we get a picture, we're going to get snapshots about the character of God, who God is. We want to know, well, who is God? Because the more we know who he is, the better we can worship him, the better we can follow him, the more we can trust him, the more you know about him, right? So I love this because right here in this very line, we get a snapshot, a picture of the character of God just from these two words, Lord God. If you have your Bibles, you can even underline that. Lord God, because he's in Hebrew, the Old Testament primarily written in Hebrew, New Testament written in Greek, but here, these words in Hebrew is Adonai Yahweh, Lord God, Adonai. That, that word means master, is one way you can translate that, Lord, master, the one who has all authority, the one who reigns, the one who is sovereign over all is what that word means. So just in just these words, Lord God, we get a picture about who God is. He is the one who reigns over all. He is master. He is Lord. He is completely sovereign over all. Incredibly important picture. Yahweh, the name that we see regularly throughout the Old Testament, it's used so many times. Yahweh is a covenant, is part of the covenant relationship that God made with Israel. God, the Lord, sovereign, king, covenant relationship. He's the Lord. Rules over all nations. Ruler over all. He is the foundation. And church, don't miss that. When we make that small, when we minimize that, it all crumbles. But when Lord God is Lord God over your life, you submit to that, you keep him first, it keeps your foundation when everything else shakes. He is the Lord God, is what he delivers here. And then follow along with me. This is what the Lord God has said about Edom, the, the nation of Edom, the, the Edomites. I just want to give you a little bit of background so there's some context here. You can go back and you can study this and where this whole thing started, but there is a long-standing rivalry between Edom and Israel. They they. Oil and water. Don't get along. Long time standing. It started with two brothers, Jacob and Esau. Those were sons of Isaac and Rebekah. And you can go back to Genesis chapter 27 and find out why the animosity between them is so intense. For good reason, you can understand. But those two brothers were the 
fathers, they come out of the nations of Israel and Edom. And the bitterness between these two nations of Israel and Edom is something that rolled one generation after another generation after another generation and just kept going. And Edom especially hates Israel. You can maybe picture the, the relationship of, uh, of Israel and Edom like you would the Hatfields and the McCoys or uh, the North and the South in the Civil War or currently uh, Israel, uh, the Israelites, the Jews, and the Palestinians. Eh, they don't get along real well. That's what's the picture idea. Understanding that is going to give us the background now why Obadiah who comes and he goes to Edom and he delivers a message to God against the Edomites because of how they were living, what they had done, the sin that had just encompassed all of their life and they were completely blind to. There's a message to the Edomites and it brings in these three short practical purposes for us. The first of them is here in verses, the rest of verses 1 through 9. Let me just read the first four verses for us. Picked up where we left off. We have heard a message from the Lord. An envoy has been sent among the nations. Now here's what the Edomites have been saying. Rise up and let us go to war against her. Verse 2. Look, I will make you insignificant among the nations. You will be deeply despised, God says. Your arrogant heart has deceived you. You who live in clefts of the rock, in your home on the heights, who say to yourself, who can bring me down to the ground? Though you seem to soar like an eagle and make your nest among the stars, even from there I will bring you down. This is the Lord's declaration. This is the first section here of where do you put your trust? Whose authority are you under? We get an inside look in just these few verses into the heart of a nation. It's the pride of a nation. They are going to rise up against and, and go to battle against Israel. They are bullies. They are cruel. They are merciless, as we're going to see. Edom is also full of themselves. Did you notice verse 3? Your arrogant heart has deceived you. You see, God sees through their heart, and he says, your arrogant heart. You're being deceived by that arrogant heart. You live in the clefts of the rock in your home in the heights. If you know of anything about Petra, uh, Petra, those beautiful temples and all those that built into the stonework and things, that's here in Edom. They have the high ground. They have uh, the high ground where they have great defenses. They are able to, they are secure in the land that they are in. All of their place are well, well guarded areas. There's limited routes of attack, so they felt invincible. They have a whole lot of security. The Edomites are boasting no one can reach us, we're secure. We're good. We're powerful. Now, as I'm thinking about the Edomites and their lives and the, how secure they were feeling, they felt they can call out like, man, I got power. We got all kinds of power. We're good. I thought, man, don't we hear that today a lot I wonder if we hear that so much in our own culture today that we don't even hear it. We don't even recognize it. Let me throw out a couple of things. I was thinking about this pervasive message. You're strong. You can do it. You can do anything you want. If you're a woman, you're a powerful woman, right? You can do it. You can do anything. It's sometimes that message is even cloaked in Christianese. But make no mistake, that message is something that's driven by pride. It's not trusting in the Lord. 
all of that message, all of that messaging, all of that, it's, it's all over our culture. Find it within yourself. You can do it. Do whatever you want. You're the powerful woman. You, are, you can do it. You can achieve it. Just put your mind to it. It's in you. Do you hear that? It's all in you. The Edomites were trusting in themselves and they were trusting in everything other than God. I'm like, well, hello, 2019. I know we have it on our dollar bill, right? And God we trust. But how far is that from us as a nation? In myself, I trust. What we read here in Obadiah has been going on across generations and across nations for a very long time. Trust in ourselves. Find it within yourself. You can do it. You're strong. You're mighty. Maybe it would be a wise lesson for us to take away from the first few verses here. That the Edomites were arrogant. And every proud human effort at self-security is ultimately going to fail before God's coming judgment. We don't have it within ourselves. So this begs the question, where is your trust? Where do you trust? Under whose authority are you under? Yours or God's? Is it your way or is it God's way? Is it your authority or is it God's authority? Very clearly for the Edomites, it was theirs. For followers of God, it's God. We don't want to trust in our stuff, trust in our own wit, trust in our own might. Put our security in, gosh, we can put our security in all kinds of stuff. Our jobs, our bank accounts, our future, our all kinds of stuff. No, believers are going to trust in the Lord. So we want our lives to show that God reigns, that he reigns in our lives. So we humble ourselves before a holy God. Humble ourselves. That's how Christians walk, humbly. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. It's up here on the screen. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God so that he may exalt you at the proper time. Where's your trust? Who are you trusting? You can tell that often when your world gets shaken. Who do you call out to? And I'm not talking about like, obviously like when we get into a bind, we're like, oh God, oh, help me. I mean, just like in your life. Who do you call out to? Do you trust him? Are you looking to God just to have trouble-free life? Because that's a myth. I don't want any suffering. And I mean, who does? But is your life more of one that says, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to look to you. I know you're going to see me through this. I, I desire to grow in you. I, I hunger for you. I thirst for you, God. So I, I, I turn to you. So are you more like the Edomites? Or are you more of a God pleaser? It's the first section here. The second purpose that we see on Obadiah is that God cares about how you respond to others. You see, the Edomites are going to respond to a crushing blow against Israel with indifference, with cruelty, and with mercilessness. 
but God cares about how you respond. Look at verse 10. God says, you will be covered with shame and destroyed forever. Here's the key word, because. You can circle that word. Because of violence done to your brother Jacob. On the day you stand aloof, on the day strangers captured his wealth, while foreigners entered his city gate and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were just like one of them. <clears throat> the time, the setting here is around 586 BC. It's in Jerusalem. It's the destruction of Jerusalem. The nation of Babylon is coming in and it is wiping out virtually the nation of Israel. The scene is unimaginable of chaos and destruction. The horrors that come out of the destruction of Israel at the time, it's atrocious. The Edomites, the nation next to them, are applauding. They're cheering, destroy it, destroy it. Yes, finally. They love what is happening to God's people. They love the destruction going on. Psalm 137 even said, quote, dash their little children against the stones and wipe out the Jews. That was the response of the Edomites. They stood by and did nothing. Indifferent, didn't care. And if only that was the worst of it. Verse 12, do not gloat over your brother in the day of his calamity. Do not rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their destruction. Do not boastfully mock in the day of his distress. They are rejoicing at the destruction of Jerusalem. By the way, remember, Jerusalem is suffering the wrath of God for their sin. They had walked away from God. Verse 13. <clears throat> Do not enter my people's city gate. In the day of their disaster. Yes, you do not gloat over their misery in the day of their disaster, and do not appropriate their possessions in the day of their disaster. They are going in and they're looting and plundering God's people. As the city of Jerusalem falls, they're plundering all of that. Verse 14 Do not stand at the crossroads to cut off their fugitives, and do not hand over their survivors in the day of their distress. They were even participating in helping in the destruction. Any of the Jews who are getting away, any of God's people who are getting away, they're stopping them at the crossroads and turning them over to the Babylonians. Indifference, cruelty, mercilessness. That's how the Edomites were responding. They had a grudge against Israel from one generation after another generation after another. Much like racism today. The hatred that can go on. But make no mistake that God cares about how we respond to others. As Christians who are empowered by the Spirit of God, we seek to, we, we, we want as Christians to see as God sees others. We want to see through his eyes. We, we want to, we, we want to bless others and not curse others. That's the response of believers. The Bible speaks of not holding grudges. The Bible speaks numerous times about forgiving others as you have been forgiven. when you've been mistreated, when there's been injustices in your world. 
that we turn those injustices and all of that, that weight that you feel and you are experiencing, you turn that, you turn it over to God. You trust God with that. You say, Lord, I'm going to trust you. You don't just hold on to it so you can get them back. Just think of your own life. As you consider your own life, your own home, I wonder if you're holding a grudge against your spouse. You're holding a grudge against somebody in your family. You won't forgive. You're going to hold on to that. Holding a grudge against a parent. Believers forgive. Forgiveness doesn't mean forgive and forget. We're just going to act like everything's okay. Forgiveness isn't like, okay, I know you did that. I'm just going to brush it under the rug. We're good now. Everything's good. That's, That's not biblical forgiveness. But forgiveness is a moment by moment time when I turn this over to the Lord. God, this hurts, and I'm struggling, so I'm going to trust you. And God, where there has been wrong, I'm going to put this in your court, for you are just, and you will accomplish your purpose. I'm going to trust you with this, and God, I'm going to offer forgiveness, because I don't know what else to do. God cares about how you respond to others. Oh, may we learn a lesson from the Edomites here. The the final purpose out of Obadiah is that God has the final say. And church, don't forget that. God has the final say. This last section shows us that God reigns. And he's in complete control. Verse 15. For the day of the Lord is near against all the nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. What you deserve will return on your own head. The day of the Lord. We know as believers with New Testament, we know as believers... Hey, thanks, Dan. We know as believers, as New Testament believers in 1 Corinthians, the day of the Lord of Jesus Christ, that God is going to bring about his purposes. When Jesus returns, God's coming back. This is great news for us as believers. Bad news if you don't know Christ. Bad news for the Edomites. Bad news for the nations. The day of the Lord. It's a judgment that's coming. Look at Isaiah up here on the screens. Isaiah chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. For the pride of mankind will be humbled, and human loftiness will be brought low. The Lord alone will be exalted on that day. For a day belonging to the Lord of armies is coming against all that is proud and lofty against all that is lifted up it will be humbled for all who are more like Edomites this should humble you for God has the final say the last few verses here are going to show us that God delivers, that he defeats the enemies, and he establishes his kingdom. Look at verse 17 and 18. But there will be a deliverance on Mount Zion, and it will be holy. The house of Jacob will dispossess those who dispossessed them. Then the house of Jacob will be 
a blazing fire, the house of Joseph, a burning flame, but the house of Esau, which is Edom, will be stubble. Jacob will, be set, will set them on fire and consume Edom. Therefore, no survivor will remain of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. <clears throat> Hard not to believe that you're not just underlining all of these verses and saying, ah, oh, these are the best verses. I want to memorize these when I get home. <laughs> I'm not sure 19 and 20 are going to do it for you either, but let me tell you what's going on here. A message to the Edomites by way of the Israelites that God has the final say, that he is going to deliver the Israelites. God delivers. And here's the biblical principle, God will deliver you. For all of you who are in Christ, God will deliver you. And God will defeat your enemies, verse 19 and 20. Get your pencils out, here we go. People from the Negev will possess the hill country of Esau. Those from the Judean foothills will possess the land of the Philistines. They will possess the territories of Ephraim and Samaria, while Benjamin will possess Gilead. The exiles of the Israelites who are in Halah and, those, and who are among the Canaanites as far as Zarephath, as well as the exiles of Jerusalem who are in Shepharad will possess the city, cities of the Negev. Wow, is that deep? Is that great? You're like, yes. I'm so glad to hear these words. <laughs> Look, God is going to defeat the enemies. God's going to defeat. That's the biblical principle drawing out of this. God is in control. He has the final say. Edom thinks they're in control, they're completely secure, they're good, they're powerful. Nobody can, oh, we're good. God says, you're not so good, I have the final say. You're full of sin, Edom. You're full of your arrogant pride. But I have the final say. Israel, no, God's people know that God is in control. He will accomplish his purposes. God delivers and he defeats his enemies. Verse 21, saviors will ascend Mount Zion to rule over the hill country of Esau, but the kingdom will be the Lord's. The kingdom will be the Lord's. The Lord God is gonna establish his kingdom. As we saw earlier, the Lord God is sovereign. He has the final say. And why is that so important? That God has the final say. Because for every one of us who deals with the injustice of life, with suffering, with pain, with the ache of life that you deal with, God has the final say. We are not home yet. God wins. Just talking this morning with somebody who's writing Revelation, reminded, you've read through Revelation, spoiler alert, God wins. The kingdom will be the Lord's. This helps me to climb Mount Perspective and look out over my life and remember that God rules, that God reigns, God's in control. With all that you're going through, all that you're suffering through, God's still in control. He cares that God cares about you and your situation. That God, this reminds me here in Obadiah, that God is not oblivious to your needs. He's not aloof. He cares. And therefore that reminds me that, that I can worship him, that I can follow him, that I can trust him because he is Lord. 
God over all. You see, Obadiah, this little book of Obadiah offers us a stark reminder to place our trust under God's authority, to fully trust him, to love and forgive and care for others, and to find our hope fully entrusting ourselves and our situations to the Lord. Trust him. That God is the one who restores. God is the one who delivers. Our hope is in Lord God, Adonai Yahweh, the Lord God. Is it? Is that where your trust is? Or do you look far more like the Edomites? Oh, would you turn afresh to the Lord God this morning? Let's pray. Oh, we turn to you. And God, we ask that we as a people, each individual, will be God-pleasers, that we will look more like God-followers far more than Edomites. That, God, we will follow your lead. We will trust you. Lord God, our Savior, Lord God, Adonai, Yahweh, Master, Savior, covenant-keeping God, we are yours. Have your way. In Jesus' name.